if you've been tracking with us, we've been going through 1 Corinthians 15 for quite a few weeks now. And I had planned to spend a little more time in 15 today, but for time's sake, I just want to review what we've talked about. Paul rehearsed the gospel. We said that, that the Greeks were denying the resurrection, so he reminded them of the gospel. This is a gospel. Christ died and rose again. And if you repent and believe in him, that's how you're saved, by grace through faith. And then he, he talked about his remarkable call. I, I, by the grace of God, was called to preach this gospel. But then he took on these people who were denying the gospel. He goes, how can you deny the resurrection? Think of the, the logical implications. And I'm just reviewing this. You can go back if, if you missed it. He said, Christianity is a lost cause. Judgment is looming. Our deceased loved ones are lost and Christians are losers. We're wasting our time. But Christ has been risen and God is going to bring death and sin under his feet and restore all things and God will be all in all. However, on Easter, we answered these two questions in 35 through the rest of the chapter. They said, how are the dead raised and what kind of body will they have? And we saw that they're raised powerfully and gloriously with a new physical body. So remember that. If you're a Christian, you're not going to float around with Jesus forever. You're going to have a physical, glorified, resurrected body, and we're going to dwell on this earth in the kingdom of God. And in the midst of our pain and sorrow, many of you have lost loved ones. Some of you, I was praying with a neighbor the other day whose wife has cancer. That's a fearful thing as we face death. And Paul shows us at the end of chapter 15 that Christ has conquered death. And we don't need to be afraid to die because death has been swallowed up in victory. So his application was abound in the work of the Lord. Be steadfast. Nothing that you do for God is wasted. Every time we waste a day, we've missed an opportunity to do something for Christ. But this morning we're in chapter 16 and we're going to look at the first 12 verses. And it's kind of cool because sometimes we skip over these, these sort of what we would consider less than important sections, but we learn a lot about Paul's personal life and ministry here. So let's pray, and then we'll start reading. Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit will do what he does so well, teach our hearts. You told us that the Spirit has been given to us so that we might know the things freely given to us by God. Thank you that you opened our eyes to know about Jesus to know the Savior's love and to have a relationship with him. And we believe that you speak to us through your word. So Lord, we draw near to you by faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God for we must believe that you are. And we must believe that your word is the truth. So whatever you have to say to us, whether it's comfort or correction or encouragement and training. Just help us to listen and grow. Thank you for what you're doing in the world and in our church. We pray that you might save lost people today and build us up and even equip us to be better disciple makers. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to remind you as you're learning, I'll often tell you, don't be afraid to take some notes. The dullest pencil is better than the sharpest memory. But when you're hearing the word of God, it's not just for you. It's not just for you. It's for you then to believe it and teach others. Paul told Timothy, the things that you've learned from me, he said, then I want you to entrust these things to others who will be able to teach others. So keep in mind the concept of discipleship, of taking these transferable truths and saying, let me teach others what it means to walk with Jesus and, and encouraging each other and, and getting to know one another and building each other up. So let's start in verses one through five where Paul says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed in the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, let each one of you put aside and save as he may prosper, that no collections may be made when I come. And when I arrive, whomever you may approve, I shall send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. But I shall come to you after I go through Macedonia, for I'm passing through Macedonia. So let's start with this. What in the world does he mean concerning the collection for the saints? 
Four times in the New Testament, Paul refers to this, this big campaign, okay? So I want to put a map up here for just a moment because this will kind of give you a way of, of sort of thinking this through. From the earliest time when Paul was converted, as he began to preach the gospel, it became clear to the believers that right here in Jerusalem, the Christians who had come out of Judaism, they were suffering badly. And one of the biggest parts of their suffering was there was a famine in this area, so it was hard for anybody to get food. But then when you became a Christian, it was doubly difficult because they ostracized you. They would take your possessions. The book of Hebrews talks about them being imprisoned. And so Paul, as, as a convert to Christ, as he preached, he had this burden that the rest of the Christians throughout the whole world here would support these Christians in Jerusalem. And so when you're reading in the book of Acts, he would talk about the collection, the collection. In fact, when he first engaged the, the leaders, the apostles, he said, I gave to them the gospel, and they said, just remember the poor, and that was something I was eager to do. So when you're reading about this collection in the New Testament, it was very specific. It was for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. Now, there were several reasons for that. Obviously, the need, but secondly, Paul believed that if he could collect money from all these other people, can, can you go back to the slide? He believed that, thanks, if he could collect money from all these other Gentile Christians, that sending it to the Jews would be a strong message of solidarity. In fact, he said in Romans 15, if Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. Think about that. Imagine saying to a Jewish person, hey, can I, can I just thank you? And they're like, for what? Thank you for being the people who, who brought the Old Testament scriptures to us. And thank you for being the race who brought us the hope of the Messiah. And of course, most Jewish people would probably look at you like, what are you talking about? But Paul actually ministers this way. He said, when I lead Gentiles to Christ, I try to provoke the Jews to jealousy. It was kind of like saying, hey, thanks for letting me come to your party. And they're like, one party. You know the party that the Messiah brought for you the one that you haven't come to yet, but you still could. So Paul always saw this collection as something that would really strengthen Jew-Gentile relationship. Third, he said, when these people receive it, he said, this is going to abound in great thanksgiving to God. It's going to bring God glory when they show up with this offering. And then finally, the fourth reason, he said, this way you Gentiles who are professing your faith in Christ can prove your obedience. Anybody can raise their hand and go, yeah, I'm a Christian. But the Bible talks about proving it by showing that your faith is real, doing something about it. Talking about your faith is not what faith is about. It's living out your faith. So with that in mind, Paul says to the, to the Corinthian church, concerning the co collection for the saints, I directed the churches of Galatia. That would be the churches up here. And he says, now I'm directing you. So what did he want them to do? Well, notice what he says. On the first day of every week, let each one of you put aside and prosper. Now, the first thing I want you to notice, the Jewish people counted their days from the Sabbath. Okay, the Sabbath was the seventh day. So the first day of the week would be Sunday. And maybe someone's going to ask you, why don't Christians meet on the Sabbath? And the Bible isn't 100% clear, but we see in a number of passages that Christians gathered on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. In fact, in Acts chapter 20, Paul says, on the first day of the week, we gathered together to break bread. So Paul's simply guiding them. I want you, re now notice, regularly on the first day of the week. And I think here, he says, put aside and save I don't think he meant bring it to the church each week. This was a specific thing. He said, but don't wait. He said, every Sunday on the first day of the week, as part of your worship, get some of your Bitcoin, the old kind, the real kind, the coins that you could see, and just start building up a gift. 
Well, how much, Paul? Now notice the phrase, as he may prosper. Well, well what does that mean, Tom? Like 10%, 2%? What do you mean, as he may prosper? And I'm going to come back to that. But I want you to notice there's a pattern here. It's regular. It's proportionate. You're thinking about it. And in fact, he says, the reason I want you to do this, he said, I don't want a collection to be made when I come. You're like, why not, Paul? Like, this morning I'd like to introduce the Apostle Paul. He comes up here, he goes, okay, folks, the people in Ukraine need money. Give it right now. Dig deeper. Give, give. The children have to live. Come on, fleece the sheep. He actually said this, I don't like taking last-minute offerings. He says, because then it's affected by greed and covetousness. You're like, fine, here. He goes, if you plan and think about it. Now, this is radical because many Christians, this doesn't even cross their mind, to think ahead of time what you're going to give and plan it out instead of just showing up and going, oh, here comes the plate. Let me pull that tired dollar out. And George Washington is like, oh, I haven't seen light. It's a whole new radical way to think about your giving. Not last minute. And we've got, there's lots of questions that, that I think this rises. He says, and then whomever you approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. Paul was expecting that by the time he collected from all of these churches, it was going to be a, a lot of money. Like he's not talking about, okay, everybody gets a, a Wawa coffee gift card. And so he was very careful that there would be a lot of people who would bring this gift for a variety of reasons. One, he didn't want to get robbed. Number two, he said, we always provide things honest in the sight of God and man. And third, you'll notice that he wanted people from various churches to come along because think of the message that sends. Americans are kind of weird in this respect. People aren't as important as our job and our money but in other cultures, it's all about the people. They don't want to know what you do. They want to know who you are. They want to know about your family. They don't just want to get a check in the mail. They, the, the solidarity of people showing up. Hey, this is brother so-and-so. This is sister so-and-so. That's one of the things that's cool as we go over and we partner in the churches in the Middle East, that we don't just send them money, but we rather send teams of people and we invite them here and we Zoom with them. There's a, there's a connection there. So Paul says, and if it's fitting for me to go, they'll go with me. Now, interestingly, at this point, Paul had not even committed to going yet. Eventually, he did commit to going and it did not end well when he went. But at this point, he's kind of dropping hints like, we'll get all this money and we'll send it there. And I mean, I'm willing if, if you guys want me to go, I'd love to be a part of it. Okay, so we're going to go down to verse 12, and then we'll loop back around and talk about, okay, so what does that have to do with us? But let's look at verse 5 again. He goes, I shall come to you after I go through Macedonia, for I am going through Macedonia. Now, can we go back to the slide? So this area up here is Macedonia, Okay. Philippi, there was a church of Berea, Thessalonica. Paul had planted these churches here. When he was in Troas, he had a dream, and a man in Macedonia said, come over and help us. And so he planted these churches. Now, he just said in this, this verse, I want to go through Macedonia. I want to visit these churches. Why? Well, I think he wanted to encourage them. He wanted to pray with them. He wanted to see how they're doing. He wanted to spend time with them. Now, what we're going to find out is he, he changed his plans. He ended, up, he ended up being so urgent, he cut this all out, and he went right to Corinth, and it was a, it was a disaster. So it's kind of fun to, to kind of dig in and go deeper. So in verse 6, he goes, perhaps I shall stay with you or even spend the winter. So anybody who has a home in Florida, you hear this all the time, right? You never hear from your friends in June, July, August, because it's boiling hot. But around January, February, they're like, hey, I was, we were thinking about dropping through. And um, do you know a really cheap hotel? Because we're on a really tight budget. Would somebody laugh? Would somebody go, he's joking, right? So Paul goes to the Corinthians, I want to spend a whole winter with you. 
not because he was freeloading. In fact, remember in the book he said, I won't take a dime from you. But he realized that after spending 18 months with these people and having left, the church was a mess, right? We've been walking through the book. The church has so many problems that he's like, I want to spend some time with you, building relationships, trying to get you back on track with the Lord. And so, but then notice what he says. After I spend time with you, he says, you may send me on my way wherever I may go. For I don't wish you to see you in passing, for I hope to remain with you for some time if the Lord permits. Unlike the adage, fish and relatives stink after three days, Paul believed that spending time with Christians was important. So notice the importance of relationships, which again, I want you to think about even here. Do you spend time with other Christians? Do you eat with them? Do you get together to talk with them? Do, do you have relationships with them or you just zip in and zip out? One of the most tragic things I ever heard from a leader in a church I used to pastor is, uh, we don't socialize with people from the church. I'm like, what? That doesn't even make sense. That doesn't sound like a Christian. These are your brothers. That would be like saying, well, maybe some of you do this, but it's, it's not good. We don't socialize with our family. I'm like, what? No, I get it. We all have an oddball, you know, in the family. Maybe we're the, we're the one. But the point is, the relationships were important to Paul. So, then he says something really cool. I shall remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective service has opened for me. And there are many adversaries. So he's right here. He's writing from Ephesus. Now, if you're reading the book of Acts, it's incredible what's happening in Ephesus. People are getting saved in droves. Go back and read Acts chapter 19. There's this huge revival. And folks, God is doing things in our country. For example, I was just informed that Calvary Chapel in Chino Hills in California had just baptized a thousand people. Tomorrow and Tuesday, there's a Calvary Chapel pastors conference down in Philly at Pastor Joe's churches, church. A thousand pastors are coming. And that's not to say that Calvary Chapel is the only thing God is doing. But God is at work in America. It's not all bad news. God is at work in Poland, Ukraine, Russia. God is working but Satan is working as well. So you'll notice what he, when he says a wide door for effective service has opened to me. Maybe it hasn't dawned on you, but I think it has. I hear over and over again, wow, there's a lot of new people. We have a lot of visitors. Folks, I can tell you this right now. There's a lot of churches around here who aren't saying that, who aren't saying, wow, we're having lots of new visitors. Now, why that is? It's not we're better, we're worse, we're good, we're bad. It's not comparison. But when God brings people into your midst, that's called a wide door for ministry. And I want you to think about that. A wide door for ministry cannot be filled by three pastors. That wide door for ministry is filled by all of us. As we look around and say, hey, are you new here? Hey, are you connected? Hey, how did you find us? Hey, how can I minister to you? So I personally think we're in a, in a great place right now. God is bringing a lot of people. But we ought not to, number one, take it for granted. You know what's interesting? Having pastored for 30, 35 years, when a church is first being planted, if we sent out a team of you to plant a church, there's such an excitement and an enthusiasm and a desire to reach new people. I mean... One person walks in the door and the entire group flocks around them. Hi, so glad. If a mouse runs across, they're like, do you want to join the church? They're so excited. But once a church is established for a while and we go through the routines, it's kind of just easy to go, wow, you know, they're, they're in my row. Like, don't they know? Like, I've been coming here for a long time. So ask God to open your heart and give you a desire to say, Lord, thank you. Their, their doors are opening but they don't just open automatically. They open through prayer. So I want to urge you to be praying for our church. Pray for all of us who preach, but pray for every Bible study, every youth ministry, every discipleship group, every growth group, every men's group, every, every opportunity 
that God gives us. Pray for open doors. These don't happen automatically. Paul urged the Christians, and I beg you, pray for me. It's not clever, winsome, oh, I like that joke you told about the farmer. I don't prepare jokes, right? We're preaching the gospel of Christ, and we're praying for God to change people's lives. Amen? Now, whenever God begins to change people's lives, Satan doesn't like it. So he says, while there is a wide door for ministry, there are many adversaries, okay? Now, those adversaries come from without and from within. So when you read the book of Acts, chapter 19, what you're going to find is there was eventually a mob riot in which they, the whole town went berserk, and they tried their very best to kill Paul. They, 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 they chased him, and, and, and he wanted to go out into the marketplace and talk to them, and his friends are like, are you crazy? They'll tear you limb from limb. And so, in the same way, Satan is always trying to attack churches from without. Now, thankfully, we're in a blessed country where that hasn't become a part of our culture, but mark this down. It might. It might. Particularly as we make a stand against certain issues that, that the world feels very strongly that you cannot oppose them. If you say anything about certain sexual preferences or gender preferences, hey, you're hateful. And it's already happening in many countries where that's becoming outlawed. So pray that if our persecution comes from without, that we could stand firm. But these adversaries also come from within. Paul said in Acts 20, there will be people coming up within your church who will try to lead the flock astray. And Satan tries to bring confusion, division, strife, marriages falling apart, parents and kids torn apart, relationships among leaders, among people. So we have to keep praying. Amen? Praying that God would not only continue to open up doors, but that we would see God's protection. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail. Now, before Paul was going to come, he said to the Corinthians, by the way, I'm going to send Timothy. In chapter 4, he said, you guys are way off base, so I'm going to send Timothy, and he's going to remind you of my ways. Now, don't forget that it's become clear in this book that they don't like Paul anymore. A lot of the Corinthians are like, we don't have to listen to you, right? The apostle who brought them to Christ is now trying to... to come back to being their spiritual father. He begs them in chapter 4. He goes, I know you have lots of tutors, but I'm your father. Will you just listen to me? So he says in chapter 4, I'm going to send Timothy. But he knows some of these guys are rough. Some of these guys are mean. And so notice what he says about Timothy. He says, now if Timothy comes, see that he is with you without cause to be afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid of bullies? Afraid of Diotrephes type men. I hear this all the time in churches where bullies make it very difficult for people to do ministry. And so Paul says, don't do that to him. The reason why is he's doing the Lord's work. Satan loves us to gossip. Satan loves us to have strong-willed people who force their agenda but the book of James says the wisdom from above is pure and gentle and reasonable. So he says, make sure that when Timothy comes, you don't bully him. You don't make it hard for him. He's here to do the Lord's work. And so he says, let no one despise him, but send, his way, send him on his way in peace so that he may come to me, for I expect him with the brethren. We're going to look at verse, verse 12, and then I want to draw out some applications. In the history of this particular church, Apollos had been incredibly helpful. You guys remember the story of Apollos in Acts chapter 19? He was a very eloquent, gifted speaker, and he didn't know the gospel real well. He only knew of John's baptism. So Aquila and Priscilla took him aside, and they trained him, right? And then the Bible says he went over to Corinth, and he helped many of the Corinthians to grow. In fact, it says he refuted and confounded the Jews. And so he was a real blessing to them. He was a gifted teacher, and they loved him. However, 
Remember earlier in the beginning of the book, Paul said, you know, this division about I am of Paul and I am of Apollos, that needs to stop. But showing Paul's humility, he didn't say, hey, listen, I'm going there. So last thing they need is Apollos because that's just going to cause more strife. Instead, Paul wanted to send Apollos. Look at verse 12. Concerning Apollos, our brother, I encouraged him greatly to come to you. That's a strong word. He's practically begging him. He goes, Apollos, this church needs some good teaching. They need you to go back and help them like you did before. Now, is it me? You've heard me talk about this before. It was not at all his desire to come now. Are you allowed to do that to an apostle? Like the apostle Paul goes, I really need you to go over there and help these Corinthians. He goes, no, I'm good. In fact, I don't want to. It's not my desire. Now, I don't think that was clouded in selfishness. He obviously felt a personal call to be doing something else. I'm sure it wasn't because he's like, you know what, I, I'm going to spend, this, spend the winter working on my golf swing. Um, no way. He was doing ministry, but he felt that it wasn't the right time. And that kind of shows you the, the, the freedom to be led by the Spirit and to collaborate and talk and pray. Paul doesn't say, jerk, selfish guy. He's like, okay, cool. I understand. So, these little details, we read about them, and it's kind of like the end of a letter. These are the words of God. And so now we stop and we ask ourselves, well, what, is this, what does this say to me as a Christian? How can I apply this in my own personal work? So I want you to look with me in verse 2 when Paul says, on the first day of the week, let each one of you put aside as he may prosper. For many years, I never preached about giving. I just didn't do it, and here's why. In fact, I just heard someone say this the other day. I believe if people love Jesus, they will just give generously. And, and, I, and I believe that. I was like, yeah. Yeah. That's right. You don't need to talk about money. The world thinks you're going to talk about money. Don't talk about money. And then over time, as I was reading the New Testament, I'm like, no one told Jesus this. In fact, he was frequently talking about money. And we're like, Jesus, cut it. You know, people are going to think you did. No. And so God radically changed my view about preaching on money. That's a part of discipleship. And it's an important part because there's a direct connection between your heart and your money. And so somebody just the other day said, oh, I was talking to my friend at work, and he's like, yeah, you Christians are all trying to get your money. That's all they want is to get your money. And the fact is, there are a lot of people who are just trying to get your money. You turn on the TV, no matter what verse in the Bible they're on, they're after your money. But because of that, we can't go, therefore, we won't talk about money at all. So maybe you've been here long enough to remember that when we started a fundraising campaign for this building, that we brought in some Christian consultants to kind of help us to get the lay of the land. And they told us this. They said, in evangelical Bible preaching Christians, you just need to know this fact, very, very accurate statistic all across America. Half of the people in the congregation give nothing. I nearly fell out of my chair. I said, you mean to tell me that in churches like ours, half the people give nothing? There's no way I believe that. And they went on to to, to persuade and show the data. And eventually, in an anonymous fashion with none of the leaders knowing who, now this was quite a while ago, probably seven years ago, they go, over 40% of your people give nothing. So what do we do with that? Well, we don't, we don't rant and rave or yell and scream because actually we're, we're in a very good place. But for many of you, it's not because of you. And you're missing out on part of what it means to be a disciple and a follower of Christ. So I'm going to be very pointed and specific in helping you as we think some of these things through. So part of being a disciple is to learn about your resources, to adopt a lifestyle of financial stewardship. 
Remember, everything that we have comes from God. Don't think, I worked so hard for it. Yeah, you worked hard, but did God give you the health? If you get prideful about it, what if he takes your health? And then, in addition, this financial stewardship would be stop overspending and learn how to get out of debt. We have in the past, and we would be willing to continue to offer seminars of financial peace to help you learn how to get out of debt and not overspend and be running up credit cards. And then third, avoid stockpiling and being self-indulgent. Remember when God told them to collect the manna? Remember what he said about manna? If you just stockpile it, it stinks. And so many Christians, all they do is work to keep the money for themselves. And that's selfish. So this morning, I want to guide you to think about a lifestyle of giving proportionately, regularly, and generously. Now, let me start with proportionately. I want you to imagine that this is a ladder. I've talked about this before. We call it a giving ladder. Many of you, based on our statistic, 40% of you aren't even on the ladder. You don't give. Now, if you're not a Christian, I get it. Why would you give? You're not saved. But if you're a Christian and you don't give, right, you are so missing what it means to be a follower of Christ. So, moving up the ladder starts with occasional giving. Now, some of you, you know, if, if they pass the plate or you happen to see the box and you have your change from Dunkin' Donuts, you're like, or you're like, come on, I put in $2 in the coffee thing, what do you want, right? So, occasional giving. But moving up the ladder, God says, on the first day of the week, put aside. So, it's regular, systematic. So, so I want to challenge you, if you're a follower of Christ, every week or every time you get paid, and even young people, if you cut grass or you, you have some income, as you prosper, start with giving something to God. The Bible says, honor the Lord with the first fruits of your increase. Frequently, people say, ah, oh, you know what? This week, we didn't have anything left for God. Well, totally forget about that. Start with when you get the money, what am I going to give God first? Imagine telling your landlord, oh, I didn't have anything left for you. Like, you're like, well, I have to give it all to the landlord. Well, when Christians tell me they can't afford to give, I usually tell them, I don't think you can afford not to give. So number one, I want to challenge you to, to, to get into the habit of giving regularly. Number two, I want you to get into the habit of giving proportionately. What do you mean by that? It means you think ahead of time how much you're going to give. You're not just randomly going, oh, I happen to go by the bank and I have a 20 today. That you're going to consider how much do I make and then what percentage of that am I going to give to God? And, and I strongly encourage you to keep a record of it. You're like, Jesus said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Well, as long as you let your head keep that a secret between the two of them, you can know, okay? Just don't let your head share it, right? Because you have to know. And I promise you, you will find yourself quite surprised if over the next year, at the end of the year when you get your W-2s and you see what you made and then you kept a record of what you give, that you will probably be surprised one way or another to say, man, I'm cheap. Or, wow, I gave more than I thought. So, it's just regular, proportionate. Now, what do I mean by proportionate? You're like, Pastor, do I have to tithe? Well, actually, tithing began, the first example of the tithe was when, when Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. Jacob later promised God, I'll give you 10%. Under the Mosaic law, they were commanded to tithe. Under the New Testament, tithing is not commanded, but I would certainly encourage you to move in that direction because I can't see any good reason biblically why most Christians shouldn't be tithing. And I promise you this, I've never met anyone who said, oh, I, we've been tithing and we just can't afford that anymore. So even if you don't have the faith right now to start with 10%, start with 3% but regularly, systematically, put it aside. Stop making excuses. I mean, I've heard it all. I actually, because we don't even pass a play. We have a box out there. I had somebody say to me in my last, or church in Texas, you know what, I had the money, but you didn't pass the plate, so I went ahead and spent it. It wasn't my fault you didn't pass the plate. I'm like, wow. 
you really believe that? So regularly, proportionately, and generously. God isn't impressed with what we give. It has a lot to do with what we keep. Generosity, it flows from a gratitude that, God, you've saved me. You, you, you've been so good to me. So let me answer another question. Who should I give to? Well, Christians, in their deep sense of independence, I choose who I give to. I give to compassion, and I give to this, and I give to this group, and I give to this missionary. I don't agree with that. I think you should start by giving to your local church first. Now, again, you might say, oh, he's just trying to get, I'm not trying to get your money. I don't want your money. I don't even know who gives what. Paul said in Philippians 4, when they gave him a gift, he goes, I don't want the money. I want you to get the blessing. But the Bible's clear. You give to your leadership. In, in the early church, they would never give individually. They gave to the leaders because they trusted that godly leaders would distribute it. Churches have budgets. We have missionaries. We have constant people saying, hey, can you, can you support us? How in the world are we going to be able to do that if everybody decides to free wheel their giving? We decide. So give first to your local church. There's nothing wrong, wrong with giving above and beyond that, but start with your local church. Prioritize giving to your home church. And then a couple final principles. The Bible talks about not procrastinating in your giving. Remembering money is not going to make you happy. Luke chapter 12 says, a man's life doesn't consist of his possessions. The Bible says, if you long to get rich, I promise you, you will plunge yourself into harmful snares for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil and many by longing for it have wandered from the faith. Greed is one of the deadly sins in the Bible. So your finances are either going to be a good servant or a bad master. So I hope that God is encouraging you and speaking to you. And finally, I want to close with these promises of blessing. God said to the church in the Old Testament under the, under the uh, leadership of Malachi, he said, you're not tithing. He said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and test me. It's the only time in the Bible says God says, test me and see if I don't open up a window of heaven and pour out a blessing on you. Now, God's not a spiritual genie with a jackpot. Give and you'll get 20% more. But test God and see. I, I would to God that the Holy Spirit would, would move each one of you. So as couples, you should talk about this. And I promise you, you're going to have some friction. It just happens. One of the three reasons for divorce in marriage is fighting over money. And if you're the spiritual leader, men, you need to take leadership here. If your wife wants to give, don't say, nah. If you're a Christian, they talk about it. And if your wife says, we ain't giving, you're the spiritual leader, okay? Now, if she has a separate bank account, which I highly discourage, don't empty her bank account giving, but, but take leadership in this. So let me read you some blessings. Proverbs 11 says, there is one who scatters, but he increases all the more. But there's, there's others who withhold what is due and they only end up in want. So we have, for example, a care ministry. We give away a lot of money. Have any of you contributed to the care ministry? Some of you do. The Bible says, he who is gracious to the poor lends to the Lord and, and he will repay him. Proverbs 22, 9 says, he who is generous will be blessed. Ecclesiastes says, Cast your bread on the waters, and you will find it after many days. Jesus said in Luke, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, run it over. It will pour into your lap. By your standard of measure, it will be measured out to you. I had somebody tell me sometimes when the plate goes around, because I don't want to be embarrassed, I just put my hand in there, but I don't put anything in there. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, this he will reap. If you sow to your own flesh, you'll reap corruption. Hebrews 6, 10, God will not forget the love which you have shown in his name when you minister to the saints. Proverbs 28, he who gives to the poor will never be in want, but he who shuts his eyes will have many curses. So, you could tell a lot about a Christian 
by his relationship to this book. You could tell a lot about a Christian by his relationship to his hymn book, but you could tell a lot about a Christian by his relationship to his pocketbook. And may God speak to your heart and stir you out of gratitude for Christ to make this a significant part of your discipleship. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, thank you for letting us look at your word. And I thank you, Father, there are many people here who are generous. I don't know who they are, but we can see that you are providing for us. But Lord, it's not about just getting money to stockpile it. There are so many more things we could do for Christ as you provide. And in addition, my brothers and sisters will be so blessed. And you told us that whatever we give to Christ, we will be rewarded for in the kingdom of God. So continue to stir within our people a generous spirit, just as Jesus was generous to us. Though he was rich, he became poor, that we might be made rich. Oh, Father, I would long that many in our church would learn to tithe and experience that rich blessing of seeing how God provides. I pray for our young people that this would sink into their hearts and they would determine from this day forward to be generous toward God, not because you need it, not because we have to, but because you're so good to us. So thank you, Lord, for what you're doing at Riverstone and may the resources that we have be used to expand the gospel, supporting our missionaries and churches and people in need. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, for the wide door of ministry that we're seeing here. Protect us from adversaries and save many more lost people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.